So today I'm going to introduce you to um, V.S. Naipaul's novel, A House for Mr. Biswas. Uh, we're going to be doing this in two parts, so roughly half an hour this week and half an hour next week, uh, because the novel is very long and the two parts of the novel are in many ways quite distinct from each other. Um, so Naipaul is, like Sam Selvin, uh, part of that Windrush generation um, that left the Caribbean to travel to England. Um, Naipaul is also like Selvin uh, of South Asian descent. Um, and yeah, he comes from uh, Trinidad's South Asian minority. Um, but he had um, rather a lot more um, in the way of educational advantages uh, than Selvin did. Uh, Naipaul, for example, uh, managed to get um, as a teenager, uh, competitive scholarships uh, to some of the best uh, secondary schools in Trinidad and was also able to win um, one of four Trinidad government scholarships that are awarded a year um, to students to go study in Oxford. Right At the time that Selvin and Naipaul were growing up, it was very, very difficult to access um, not just higher education, but even um, secondary education um, in much of the Caribbean. Um, there, were no, there was no university in Trinidad, for example, until 1970. Um, if you wanted to go to college, you had to go to Britain or to the United States. And as I said, there were only those four scholarships that the government offered to send students to British universities. Naipaul was the recipient. Um, of one of those. So his writing strategies are often rather different uh, from Selvin's, right? You'll recall, for example, that Selvin wrote all of the Lonely Londoners in a kind of synthetic West Indian dialect, right? A kind of generalized West Indian dialect that can't be tied down to Trinidad or to Jamaica. Um, or to the Bahamas or Barbuda or you know, any specific place because all of the London generation, all of these, this Windrush generation in London are united more by a certain set of common experiences than by um, origin in the exact same place. A uh, House for Mr. Beeswas, as you've probably already noticed if you've started reading it, reads much differently. First, there are two layers of language in the novel. The dialogue is in West Indian dialect, particularly the dialect peculiar to the South Asian minority in Trinidad. But the narration is in the Queen's English, right? So the voice of the narrator is very much kind of at odds with the voice of the characters, right? The voice of the narrator is much more assimilated into a British cultural tradition than the voices of the characters. So keep that in mind as you're reading and try to think about why that is and why that might be important. Naming is also something of a distancing device in the novel. You will note, for example, that Right. Mr. Biswas has a name, right? We're told his name on the, his first name on the very first page of the novel is Molin. But no one, the, well, the narrator anyway, never refers to him as Molin. Other people do, but the narrator always refers to him as Mr. Biswas, even when he is a small child. So I want you to be thinking about why that is as well. Why is this narrator? constantly referring to this character as Mr. Biswas. There's something almost faintly ridiculous about um, you know, these scenes where there's a child leading a calf around, right? And the child is being referred to as Mr. Biswas. Now, one thing you probably noticed about the Lonely Londoners is the absence of a conventional plot structure, right? That It's structured more as a series of vignettes or a series of episodes that are centered around the character of Moses Alouette and his, his acquaintances, 
A house for Mr. Biswas, on the other hand, makes specific reference to 19th century, well, 19th and 20th century European literary traditions, uh, particularly uh, the Bildungsroman, the novel of developments, right, where you, know, you start with the character in childhood, um, say a novel like uh, um, Jane Eyre would sort of fit this pattern, or Goethe's Wilhelm Meister, um, even uh, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man um, fits the same sort of basic pattern, right? And it shows sort of the development of that protagonist's personality um, over time, right? <clears throat> the structure of the novel, this by the way is what the original uh, cover of the British edition looked like. Um, the structure of the novel also models, uh, is also modeled on the kind of fictionalized autobiography that was common in 20th century uh, European literature. Uh, for example, a novel like uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So the next thing I want to talk about is the way in which the novel references elements of Naipaul's family history. I don't usually like to get too biographical when we're talking about a novel, but in this case, he is working uh, with materials taken from his own family history directly. So this is Knight Hall as a youngish man sitting at his writing desk looking very serious. So the character of Mr. Biswas is based on Knight Hall's own father, uh, Sipersad. And Sipersad Knight Hall uh, was a relatively unsuccessful journalist and fiction writer. Um, living in Trinidad, who self-published a volume of short stories in 1943. But there was no real market for them. Right? No one in the Caribbean was buying this sort of thing. There wasn't really a market yet in Britain or the US for short stories in the Caribbean. And Naipaul himself has often talked about sort of the difficulties of living a literary life, a writer's life, um, in Trinidad, right? So the first thing I've got here is a quote from Naipaul himself, talking about sort of the problems that face the local writer generally, right? The writer who is not addressing a global or at least an international audience. Right? A reading to a small group, publication in a magazine soon lost a view. Writing in Trinidad was an amateur activity, and this was all the encouragement a writer could expect. There were no magazines that paid. There were no established magazines. My father was a purely local writer, and writers like that ran the risk of ridicule. So because his father writes in local dialects and is concerned only with local matters, Naipaul argues, there are no venues in which he can actually make money as a writer in Trinidad. Because he is not reaching for a British or even an American audience, he's doomed to remain um, in a kind of local literary ghetto. Now, Naipaul also tends to regard the literature of the West Indies as a kind of grab bag of British, African, and South Asian traditions. And we'll see this um, in the description of, sort of the building of various houses, right? The house on Sikkim Street, for example, in which Mr. Biswas uh, dies, right? We know at the beginning of the novel that he has died untimely at the age of 46, right? Same age as my Paul's own father. That the house has been constructed out of whatever materials came to hand at the time. And schooling in Trinidad would have been primarily um, done sort of using the British system. So he'd be learning Wordsworth, he'd be learning um, Samuel Johnson, he'd be learning you know, sort of the classics, uh, Shelley, Keats, the classics of English literature, Shakespeare, and then mixing them with the African and South Asian traditions um, that were sort of common in West Indian street culture. 
But Biswas's repeated mantra, right, throughout the novel, something he learns in school, right, in this kind of school that is on the British model, ought oughts are oughts, right? That is, zero times zero equals zero. You can't make something out of nothing. And when Mr. Biswas in the novel looks around him, particularly when he is still in rural Trinidad, what he sees around him is nothing, right? Nothing he can make any sort of imaginative life out of. And we already talked about the, the relative lack of educational opportunities uh, for young people <coughs> in Trinidad in the 30s and 40s. So it might also help if we talked a little bit about the Hindu population in the West Indies and how they got there and how they were treated when they got there. Right? We've alluded to this a little bit at various times, but we may as well sort of spell it out in a little more detail. Right, so 25% of the total population of Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago uh, is Hindu. Um, at least as of uh, 1995 census, which was the latest information I could get a hold of. So, in 1845, the British government permitted colonists in the British West Indies to hire South Asians to come to the Caribbean as indentured workers. Now this was because in 1833, the British Empire had abolished slavery throughout its dominions. So all of the African slave population in the West Indies, at least in the British West Indies, was by 1834 free and could demand higher rates for their labor. So what these colonists start doing in 1845, right, systems of indenture had you know, been common in the British Empire since 1833, but it's only in 1845 that they're allowed to do it in the Caribbean. They start bringing in South Asians to work as indentured laborers, right? So essentially, right, they're given a contract for a period of years. It was usually five years for which they had to work for the person who paid their passage. They were often tricked into getting on the boat. They would go, um, recruiters would go into inland areas in India and lure people onto ships at the coast uh, with promises of jobs, with promises of money, with promises of a better life. And then these guys end up, mostly, I say guys because it was mostly men who were lured over. Very few women and children were brought over. When they got off the boat, they were worked nearly to death in sugar plantations, paid very poorly, if at all, um, and were often forbidden from leaving the estates where they were employed. So they got there, they were poor, and they were stuck. As the minority on the island, um, and not just the minority, there's a white minority in Trinidad and much of the rest of the West Indies as well, um, but the white minority was traditionally powerful. As the brown minority, South Asians were typically excluded from power and influence in Trinidad and were often treated as third-class citizens. Right? It was harder for them to get the right to vote. Um, their cultural institutions um, were often not respected. Uh, their festivals uh, were not permitted. Even some of their burial practices uh, were not uh, were not permitted in Trinidad, for example, until 1953. And essentially, because these guys had to make accommodation with a new reality in which the formation of traditional families was difficult, this also led to a breakdown in distinctions 
between casts. Now we see in A House for Mr. Biswas that most of the character, most of the South Asian characters do still regard caste as important, right? Brahmins, for example, the priestly caste at the top of the system, still command a lot of respect. Um, this is one of the reasons why the Tulsis respect Hari so much, the constipated uh, Brahmin Pundit. This is um, a West Indian Brahmin. Um, a Pundit, by the way, um, you'll also see it spelled Pandit, in other places, um, is essentially um, a priest, a scholar, and a teacher. Right? He's someone who performs uh, rituals for congregants. So you know, he'll go and bless a house, as Hari does when um, Mr. Biswas and Shama move to the chase. Um, they will cast horoscopes for uh, newborn children. They will <clears throat> teach the Sanskrit scriptures and uh, Hindu philosophy uh, to students. But we see elsewhere, like apart from the residual respect given to Brahmins, right, Mr. Biswas is a catch for the Tulsi family because he's, uh, because he's born into the Brahmin caste. Um, this leads to people not really making much of these distinctions otherwise anymore. There are other distinctions that seem to matter more, like, for example, money. So Naipaul's attitude towards colonialism and nationality um, is a little bit more complicated than that of a lot of other uh, post-colonial writers. And he comes in for a lot of criticism from some quarters uh, because of his relatively unusual views. Right, so this is a quote directly from Naipaul himself. Right? In England, I am not English. In India, I am not Indian. I am chained to the 1,000 square miles that is Trinidad, but I will evade that fate yet. And much of Naipaul's writing, both his fiction and his nonfiction writing, is really kind of pervaded by a resistance to rootedness, right? A resistance to claiming any particular place as his own. So he calls himself an ex-colonial who is now a homeless cosmopolitan. Politically, he has sometimes called himself a nationalist, but one who is dismayed by what he regards as the weakness and backwardness of various colonized people. And while he expresses anger over the brutality of European imperialism and the difficulties it left behind in its formal, uh, former colonies, uh, you know, when the British, the French, the Belgians, what have you, all just sort of picked up stakes and went home, he praises colonists for bringing modern thought to the colonies and also a sense of stability, right? He praises the British in India, for example, for putting an end to uh, the various sort of small local wars that were common before the arrival of the British, but castigates the British um, for the partition of India and for leaving before he, he feels the civilizing work that needed to be done was finished. He believes in what he calls a universal civilization that's essentially based on the values of advanced Western and East Asian democracies. So, you know, the values of the USA, Canada, Western Europe, and Japan, with the sort of combination of social tolerance, particularly for um, the rights of minority groups, and their ability to provide material comfort to their citizens uh, through networks of global capitalism. So, He's very much um, of the same sort of mindsets uh, as a thinker like uh, Francis Fukuyama, who wrote a book called The End of History, 
Uh, Fukuyama believed that with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, essentially the whole world was going to embrace American-style global capitalism, and that that was going to bring prosperity and democracy to parts of the world where it had been where, where it had been slow to develop. Um, Naipaul doesn't seem to agree quite with Fukuyama's idea that um, freedom and demo you know free markets and democracy are inevitable everywhere. Um, he looks, for example, with a rather jaundiced eye um, on many uh, Muslim nations. But he does seem to share this idea that this offers the best possible set of life outcomes uh, for citizens of these countries. And it suits his own sense of placelessness, right? his own sense of not belonging to any particular nation. So let's talk a little bit about the houses that Mr. Biswas inhabits in the first half of the novel and why they matter. This is a fairly typical uh, Trinidadian plantation house. You can see that it looks rather like it is assembled out of, um, again, a variety of available materials. Right, whatever happened to be to hand at the time. You know, the roof is in sort of, you know, corrugated tin. Um, not, the shape of the house is consistent, but it rather looks like, you know, the windows are different, um, you know, the, the panes are different shapes and sizes. Um, the staircase is a different color from the rest of the facade, all that sort of thing. So, Naipaul actually seems to like to structure his work around, particularly when he's working in this kind of buildings Roman form, he likes to structure his work around the four stages of adult life. Um, in Hindu thought, right? You have a different dharma, a different duty to follow in each different stage of life. You student, married householder, adult scholar, and finally, elderly hermit, who retreats into the wilderness for spiritual pur for the purpose of meditation and spiritual enlightenment. So, when he's still a dependent, right, he first lives in his parents' home, which is lost to him by the death of his father. His aunt Tara and her husband Iota's compound um, is his home for a time. But he's never really more than a guest there, right? He's always sort of slipping in and out and living in other places. For example, he's educated for a time at Pundit Jairam's until he manages to, eh, let's say, commit an impure act there. We'll let you read to figure out exactly what that was and get himself kicked out. He's then sent to Iota's brother, Bandat's rum house, to work. And finally ends up living with the wealthy Tulsi family at Hanuman House. So for much of his early life, he is entirely dependent for a place to live on his wealthier relatives. And what I'd like you to do is look at these different homes and the way they function in the narrative, right? Compare them to one another. How are the values of, say, Hanuman House Different from the values of Terra and Iota's compound. Now, on his own, in the first half of the novel, now I put his own in quotes here because it's himself and his wife Shama and their children, but these houses are still owned by the Tulsis, right? He is still dependent on Shama's family at the time he lives, at the Chase, which is a mud hut where he keeps a small store, and at Greenvale, where he is working for um, Shama's uncle Seth as a driver. 
Now, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the Tulsis themselves as a kind of portrait of an immigrant family. Now, one thing to note about the Tulsis is that in some ways, they are extremely traditional. Right? They show a great deal of respect for the Brahmin brother-in-law, Hari, right? the constipated holy man, as Biswas likes to call him, and a real disdain for the reformist Aryan movements um, among West Indian Hindus with which Biswas sympathizes, at least for a time. Right? The Aryan movement, he said, that has nothing to do with um, Nazi ideology, anything like that. Right? The Aryans were the tribe from which modern Hindus descended. Right? They originally come from Central Asia, um, were probably related to the ancestors of the Greeks and Romans, um, and <clears throat> it's their religious scriptures that become the basis uh, for Hinduism. Uh, the Nazi concept of the pure Aryan race uh, mostly comes out of completely batshit insane uh, 19th century occult writings. So this Aryan movement uh, is a modernizing movement right, that wants West Indian Hindus to make more accommodations with the world in which they, the modern world in which they find themselves. We also see that the Tulsis do have a hierarchical family structure. Right? There is a definite authority figure, and even among the sisters, right, and their husbands, there is a sort of definite power ranking. Some are more powerful and influential than others. But they break from traditions in a variety of ways as well. One, the family is matriarchal. Now, one thing that's extremely unusual about this, right, we noted when we talked about the migration of indentured laborers from India to the Caribbean, right, almost all of those who went were men. There were relatively few women and very few children who came over. So for the Tulsis to have a matriarchal social organization, um, one is not only uh, not especially traditional, it's also highly unlikely in this particular environment. We also know that they are eaters and sellers of meat and of fish. Not typical for high caste Hindus. And that they send their children to a Christian school. So we see um, among the Tulsis, right, they call their house Hanuman House after you know, the Hindu monkey god, uh, who is you know, something of a kind of divine trickster figure. But in many ways, they are moving towards, despite their disdain for the Aryan reformists, um, a kind of assimilationist cultural model. Right? They are becoming more like the wealthy white plantation owners who would have been the power on the island. And we also see that the Tulsis do not pay Biswas a dowry when he marries Shama. Despite the fact that they're marrying their daughter to a Brahmin, this should be a big deal. But this Brahmin is then brought into the house as a dependent and they never pay him for his sign painting work either. So here we have um, a photograph of some South Asian women in Trinidad around the turn of the, uh, the, around the, turn of the 20th century. So last thing to note here, um, there's been a lot written about Naipaul's attitude towards women and he is often regarded by critics um, as 
something of a misogynist. In a lot of ways, this is a fair characterization. Um, he tends to treat women in his novels as obstacles to men's development. Right, so while he is, on the one hand, sort of critical of violence towards women, right, most of the wife beaters that we see in the novel, these those who are relatively regular wife beaters, are unappealing characters, right? When Biswas gets into an argument with Shama and beats her, it's actually kind of shocking to us. Um, <clears throat> this doesn't seem like typical behavior to him, uh, for him. But the Tulsi women are bullies who stifle and frustrate the more ambitious men living in their households. And we see from the beginning that the marriage between Biswas and Shama is not entirely successful. He's sort of coerced into marrying her. And her family then limits his prospects for much of the rest of the novel. And finally, we have Biswas's difficulties with women in his own family, his difficulties with his Aunt Tara, his difficulties with his mother, um, his difficulties even with Bandat's wife. Right? Um, so this is one particular theme in the work I want you to pay attention to. Right? I want you to look at the way Naipaul depicts women, how the men in the novels treat women, um, and how the women in the novels, in turn, respond to the men. All right, so that's all I've got for you on this today. Um, we will come back to it next week. So <laughs> finish reading the novel, get your response papers up. Um, hope you enjoy it, and we'll move on when we're done with the house for Mr. Biswas um, to Edward Kemal Brath uh, Brathwaite's poem, um, The Arrivance. All right, take care.